Hello, uh, this video is going to help you write your research paper on police brutality. Um, so let's get into the PowerPoint. So police brutality is in the news yet again after a video of the killing of George Floyd by a Minneapolis policeman surfaced. Um, if you haven't seen the video, it is very disturbing and hard to watch. Um, a group of um, police officers are seen restraining George Floyd. One police officer uh, has his knee on George Floyd's neck for approximately eight and a half minutes. Uh, in that eight and a half minutes, George Floyd can be seen uh, saying that he can't breathe um, and also at one point even crying out uh, for his mother. Um, obviously, the death is incredibly tragic. Um, and uh, the death predictably kickstarted protests across the country. Um, centered on uh, protesting police brutality and violence and um, racism, particularly within um, police departments. Uh, so these uh, protests um, have brought to light um, different violent encounters with the police have been, uh, or I'm sorry, violent encounters with the police have been uh, documented and scrutinized um, and police tactics in handling protests and rioters have also been uh, scrutinized and criticized as well. So obviously police violence is a hugely important social problem that everyone is fascinated by and talks about, but I'd be remiss if I didn't of course mention police violence is brought up in the national conversation in the context of race, and I think appropriately so. There's empirical evidence that I've included in the description um, that shows uh, Black Americans are more likely to are more likely to be subjected to violent and negative interactions with the police than white Americans. And I think the um, American population by and large uh, thinks that there is an uneven policing of black Americans um, compared to relative to white Americans going on in a lot of um, police departments. So part of your job in um, writing your paper about police brutality or violence is first narrowing this social problem into something that you can actually tackle in four to five uh, pages, which is the length of your uh, paper. Um, so the reason why I wanted to uh, give you a broad social problem and then have you actually narrow that social problem into something that you can write about is because I wanted you to practice an important skill that you're going to need in college. So in college, I can um, attest that um, oftentimes the assignments are are have a lot of freedom. Um, and some of the things that I think freshmen run into in particular is that um, they pick too broad of a topic to write about or their argument is too broad. Um, and it's, it's um, hard to write. It makes it difficult to write a convincing paper um, that is well-researched and has a strong argument um, and considers alternative viewpoints, et cetera, um, if your topic is too broad. Um, I think it is a skill to be able to um, craft a paper um, about a uh, topic that you can write convincingly about within four to five pages or within a certain page length um, and, and narrowing um, you know, a broad topic of interest into something that you can uh, convincingly write about. It is a skill. And I'll give you an example of um, problems that I've seen um, other students run into, at least within um, writing a high school research paper. So last year when I was the AP World History teacher, um, students had me review their research papers um, for another class uh, that they were writing uh, because they were curious as to what I would think about them. And um, a lot of students did have a lot of trouble, not because they were having trouble finding sources, but because the topics that they picked um, to write about were so broad. So one student I know, um, he showed me his paper and he said that he was having trouble, you know, writing and coming up with an argument. Um, and then I asked what his topic was and he said his topic was climate change. That's obviously a very big topic. And I think he would have, um, you know, been more confident in the paper he was writing and uh, more confident in the argument he was making if he would have narrowed that topic. Uh, perhaps if he would have narrowed that topic to maybe uh, climate change um, leading to um, wars or violent catastrophes or, or some other narrow topic like climate change's effects on um, maybe um, the Texas coastline, something that narrowed that topic so that way he 
um, still had a lot of sources that he could draw on, but also um, not so many that beca that it became overwhelming. So I think it's an important skill to be able to narrow your social problem. How you can narrow the topic of police brutality and violence, um, I'm just going to give you some uh, different suggestions. So obviously, um, there's so many different ways to do it. Um, and um, I expect you to get creative with it. So for example, you could talk maybe about um, police violence and brutality um, in, against um, black kids in high schools um, or police responses to peaceful protests or riots, um, maybe bring into question some of the tactics that they used or the strategies that they used, or maybe the prosecution of police brutality. Do uh, police officers get charged um, you know, when there's clear cases of misconduct, are they convicted when there's clear cases of misconduct, et cetera? So you can talk about those various social problems um, or narrow the social problem of police brutality um, into something that you can um, more convincingly tackle. Um, one of the things that I also wanted to do in this video, however, is introduce these two key terms, um, police militarization and legitimacy, and I'll explain why. Um, I think that they can help facilitate um, your uh, research about police brutality and police violence. And I think that this is something, too, that um, are terms that are not necessarily a part of the AP U.S. government and politics curriculum, but I think are um, very important for understanding police violence um, by and large. And maybe you can incorporate them into your essay. So the first term that I wanted to talk about was the militarization of the police. And so the definition of militarization of the police, the one I came up with, are police are starting to look, to act, look and act like the military. Um, in recent decades, local police agencies have militarized their departments to varying degrees, uh, adopting weapons, clothing, tactics, and the organizational structures uh, developed for war. Um, so the two causes of the militarization of the police, um, I think you would need to do further research if this is something that you particularly want to focus on your essay about, um, are uh, in the United States, um, criminals often have all types of weapons, high powered rifles, et cetera. Um, and so one part, you know, a militarized police force is kind of necessary to tackle um, those types of criminals and to address those types of um, criminals that are armed with high power weapons, et cetera. Um, another, I guess, driving force behind the militarization of the police is the wars in Iraq and Afghanistan. Um, so a lot of police military technology actually gets, or uh, sorry, a lot of military technology and equipment um, used in Afghanistan and Iraq actually gets, um, after it becomes outdated, um, through a Department of Defense program, actually finds its way onto American streets. Um, and then police forces uh, modify them um, to meet their needs. Uh, so just to show you militarization of the police, like images of militarization of the police, and then I'll talk about like the implications of military or militarization of the police and its relationship potentially with police violence and, and brutality in a bit. But I wanted to show you a couple of pictures. Um, so first I wanted to show you this picture of um, a militarized police force um, responding to protests and riots um, and looting in um, Ferguson, Missouri. Um, after the 2014 um, killing of Michael Brown, there was all kinds of protests, peaceful protests, riots, and of course, uh, looting as well. Um, the police were often criticized for how they responded. Um, the Ferguson police and, and, and uh, Missouri police departments that assisted in the response uh, looked very militarized. Um, this is frowned upon, pointing your weapon at, um, at, at someone, but we'll, that can maybe become a subject of a different conversation. Pointing your weapon at someone and not being prepared to use, like you're trained in the military never to point your weapon on someone unless you're, you're prepared to use it. Um, so you can see obviously this person uh, doesn't appear to be a threat. Um, there are other examples of like the militarization of the police. Um, here's a very provocative image where um, a peaceful protester in Baton Rouge, Louisiana, after protesting the killing of Philando Castile, um, is uh, detained by police officers that, for lack of a better term, look like RoboCop. Um, but militarization of the police can also be um, a culture, too. Um, 
we often see a very militarized police um, in response to protests and riots, et cetera, um, in how they dress, but it can also be a culture. Uh, and what I mean by culture is that um, police can have like a culture uh, that is militarized. Uh, for example, the war on drugs. So if police think that um, their job is to go to war every day, um, that can um, be an example of police militarization. And that relates to police violence and brutality, and I'll explain that in a bit. But I also wanted to show you a quick image. Okay. Uh, so I literally was looking and preparing this PowerPoint, and I Googled San Benito PD SWAT, and I was expecting to maybe get um, like an image of a SWAT team and that I could use and, and, and show. Well, I actually found this news article, City Receives Armored Vehicle at No Cost, um, that shows um, just how uh, militarization of the police, um, how how widespread of uh, issue it is, right? So police departments in San Benito um, obviously apply to get this military vehicle. The application isn't very hard to get, um, or isn't very hard to, to do. Um, and they got this military vehicle, this uh, 700,000 military uh, vehicle that is mine resistant, et cetera, that they can use um, to police. The, the way that this is problematic, and I guess the logic behind why this is potentially a problematic um, development and which relates to police violence and brutality is it, um, it first could psychologically affect police officers. So if police officers are starting to look and act more like the military, um, does that have a psychological effect on police officers? I guess this would be the logic of why if militarization of the police can lead to police violence and police brutality. Does that have a psychological effect on police officers that their job is to respond to uh, problems like the military, meaning violently? Um, does that mean that um, they stop treating communities that they are sworn to serve and protect um, and members of those communities, not as fellow citizens, but as combatants, as enemies. Um, and there is some empirical evidence, um, some evidence out of uh, Princeton University, a political scientist out of Princeton University, which is included in the description, that talks about um, the um, militarization of the police as also being um, detrimental, right, um, in terms of their reputation, that it actually damages people's perceptions of the police too. So it could be like a double whammy. And I'll, I'll talk more about that later, but sorry, let me focus a little bit about, um, you know, the psychology behind it. Um, perhaps if police officers start thinking like in terms of war, in terms of going to war, in terms of we're fighting the war on drugs. And this, these ideas and the equipment that they have starts to look more militarized. Um, maybe this has an effect and actually helps exacerbate the problem of police violence and police brutality. Um, so one phrase that is often used a lot of the times that I've heard a lot in my own studies too, is that when you give someone a hammer um, to solve problems, suddenly everything becomes a nail, right? So if you give someone, you know, these mine resistant vehicles, um, these high powered rifles, et cetera, that maybe in some cases are needed uh, to take on, um, you know, criminals that are, have high powered rifles, et cetera. Um, but maybe sometimes that leads to abuse, right? Maybe they get overused. And maybe this is contributing to this problem of violence, et cetera. Um, so this is a concept that I definitely wanted to interest or to introduce, um, et cetera. So there is empirical evidence to suggest, however, that the militarization of the police can actually be detrimental to the public's perception of the police. Um, there's a Princeton University political scientist that shows that um, police units that are militarized and people that see militarized police, um, they take a hit in terms of their reputation. People don't like to see that. They really don't like to see these images of police that look like robocops, of police with those huge um, vehicles, uh, militarized vehicles uh, patrolling down the street. They really don't like to see that. That actually hurts their reputation. Um, which gets me into the second concept. One of the essential features of policing 
that police need to really do their job effectively is legitimacy. Um, legitimacy is this idea that um, there that there's a belief that a rule institution or leader has the right to govern. So um, political leaders want legitimacy and they get it in very di various different ways. Maybe they win an election or maybe um, they sit behind the Oval Office and, and, and uh, they get it various different ways. But police departments also need legitimacy in the same way that your teachers need legitimacy as well, right? Um, as students, uh, teachers that are effective need students that believe that they have a right to rule um, over the classroom space, right? And you don't just get legitimacy by being coercive, right? By being threatening. You also get legitimacy by, um, you know, showing that you're um, trying to do good, et cetera, right? And so police forces that are militarized um, might uh, suffer reputation costs, and this might affect their legitimacy in the eyes of the public. Um, so legitimacy, if an institution doesn't have legitimacy in the eyes of maybe a particular group, maybe like an African-American community or, or another particular community, or maybe the community by and large, um, that becomes very dangerous, right? Um, especially if they, they will power. That leads to all kinds of clashes um, with them. Um, so I would argue that um, that's a, an important concept to keep in mind is the concept of legitimacy. Um, um, in your uh, research exploration um, regarding this this social problem. So um, I also wanted to get in specifically into the assignment itself really quickly, um, if I can. OK. Where is it? I wanted to get specifically into the assignment itself. Um, to kind of talk about this. So the assignment is in at least four pages, you're going to describe a social problem and provide proposals to solve that social problem. Um, so the first thing you have to do is narrow your social problem. So the social problem of police violence and brutality is a very broad social problem. And like I said, you need to find a way to narrow it. So narrow it in whatever shape and form you want, um, but um, you can definitely um, ask and reach out for me for help but you're definitely not going to be talking about police violence and brutality broadly, right? Because that's not a very viable thing um, to do within a four to five page paper. You need to be talking about something a little bit narrower um, than that. So um, step two kind of goes with step one. If you're at odds with how to actually do that, then maybe you can skim the articles and videos that I've compiled for you. And remember that you need to choose at least four that you will use in your paper. Um, so the benefit of me compiling articles and videos for you is that you don't have to waste time with citations because um, this is, you just have to copy and paste it and it'll automatically go into your works cited pages at the end. I, here you can see that I've compiled um, different sources for other um, social problems that can potentially be the topic of your research paper. Um, but you do need to find at least two articles relevant to your paper that are not found in the list that I provided. But remember, they have to be reliable sources. So you can look at the list of reliable sources that I've given you. Um, certainly, I don't want to inhibit your freedom just to those particular uh, list of reliable sources that I've given you. I want you to explore others. Um, but when in doubt about the reliability of a source, please contact me and I'll tell you whether it's reliable or not. Um, if you're just typing in like police brutality and violence in YouTube videos and coming across a random YouTuber, that's obviously not going to be as reliable a source as maybe something from a think tank, a major newspaper publication, or um, you know even a um, journal article or, or a book, of course. Um, then I would recommend that you have the citations before you start writing. You create your work cited before you start writing. If you do the bare minimum and only include two outside sources, um, that are not found in the list that I provided, um, then you would only really have to create two citations for those two sources and then include them in at the end of your paper. Um, yeah, I recommend doing the citations before you start writing um, only because uh, when you start writing a paper in college and stuff like that, um, I've made the mistake of not doing the citations before I start writing. Um, of not doing all the research before I start writing. And then it gets so tiring because when you finish a paper in college, oftentimes you're finishing it like right up to the deadline, which maybe is a midnight, midnight deadline 
or you're spending a lot of time on it late at night, um, the last thing you want to do after you finish the paper is to have to cite your sources because you're so tired afterwards. So um, that's just a little advice from me. I, I expect your work cited to be done beforehand. Um, and I think that this is definitely something that you should be doing in college as well when you go to college next year. And then write your paper. What should your paper actually physically include? So your paper should have an introduction with some sort of thesis statement. I'll talk a little bit more about the thesis statement after I get into what your paper specifically has to have. Um, it should also have a historical overview of the narrow social problem that you have identified. Um, so a historical overview includes uh, what were the key actors roles in either exacerbating or fighting the social problem. So previously, um, you know, how has the social problem gotten better or, better or worse? And what were the roles of key actors? So maybe talk about, um, I get, I would imagine in this case, you could talk about maybe judicial branch decisions regarding police brutality. Um, you could talk about uh, maybe important political leaders like President Trump or President uh, Obama's stance towards police brutality and the way that they're um, executive um, uh, or that the executive branch of government took on police brutality and police violence. You can talk about specific social movements. You can go back for a lot further in time and talk about the civil rights uh, movements. Um, I can imagine and you know how they they um, interacted with the police um, and key leaders of those movements or you can talk about recent court cases or, or past court cases and of course um, you can also talk, don't have to go back that far, and you can talk about maybe the Black Lives Matter movement, um, which uh, originated after the death of Trayvon Martin um, in Florida. You can talk about, um, you know, changes in perceptions of the Black Lives Matter movement, um, and maybe just focus on that. Um, but if you're just going to focus on something like that, then it has to be, you know, integrated and embedded in your essay in a way um, that shows the significance of just focusing on that. So I recommend a little bit of everything, um, but you could just focus maybe on one particular uh, key actor or, or a couple of key actors. You don't have to focus on all of them. This, however, um, because this isn't really where you're going to do the bulk of your arguing. There's not going to be a lot of, you know, argumentative nature to this. There can be. Um, this should be about a page and a half. The bulk of what I want you to do is the solutions. So I want you to offer at least two solutions to the social problem you are tackling. Um, those, the fact that it says only two solutions is like deceptively easy because, um, yeah, it's just two solutions, but I don't want you to just list them, right? If it has to be two and a half pages at least, I want you to describe who will be tasked with uh, designing and implementing your proposals. You can get as creative as possible. You can imagine yourself in a leadership position, um, maybe a member of Congress uh, proposing something to uh, fellow party members or maybe the president proposing legislation to Congress, etc. Um, so get as creative as you want with this. Um, but I need to know who's tasked with implementing these proposals and designing it. Um, then I want some sense of what's the feasibility of the solutions that you offer. Um, will they ever happen? Uh, what's the timeline? And what the question that kind of goes with that is what, who and what types of actors will push back? Are there going to be unions that push back? You can imagine that police unions might not be receptive to some of the solutions that you offer. Um, maybe particular interest groups, um, the political parties, the judicial branch, states, uh, how are the media going to cover this? What kind of media is going to be receptive to your solutions and what kind of media is not going to be receptive to your solutions? And it's going to tell their viewers that your solutions are, are crud. Um, so, and then explain why they might not be receptive to your solution. So be charitable. Uh, don't set up a straw man argument where you're just like, they're not going to be acceptable, accept my solutions because they're dumb. No, be charitable. Uh, why might they have reservations about the solutions you offer? And then explain what you will do to overcome. Um, so think of ways in which the solutions that you offer are, um, uh, can be, um, are, are important. And think of ways that um, out, or think of different allies that you might make, whether they be like particular political parties or interest groups, et cetera, uh, that you might make um, to get um, these solutions implemented. So also another thing that, oh, the thesis statement. So a thesis is uh, a claim, um, which is something arguable and valuable, which we've talked about in class. A thesis statement also has a kind of like why and because, right? So why are you making that claim? 
Um, so since the bulk of your arguing is going to be like the solutions portion of your essay, I think that your thesis statement to be effective needs to um, give a preview of what your solutions are going to be and some short rationale. I don't want it to be long, but thesis statements don't have to be reserved to one sentence. I think um, this myth that developed at Idea San Benito where thesis statements are one sentence and that they look pretty and that you could fit them on a bumper sticker, um, that's a myth, right? Um, in most thesis statements are usually a little bit longer. They may be two or three sentences. Um, they're usually found at the end of your introduction, but they don't necessarily have to be. But I, I do want your thesis statement at the end of your introduction. Um, also, thesis statements project what are or offer a preview of what the reader can expect to see in your essay. Um, so maybe just giving um, a sense of what important historical um, stuff you're going to talk about in your essay in this section um, would also be wise to do. I also want you to include at least five of these terms in your paper in any sections above and explain its significance. So you can um, list and explain the significance of any of the following amendments, civil liberties, civil rights, federalism, implicit bias, legitimacy over policing, political police militarization, political polarization, socialization, popular sovereignty, social contract or structural racism. So some of these terms are new to you um, that you can find in uh, either online or in the description of these YouTube video, like the definitions. Um, some of them are stuff that you should know in the class. Um, I want you to use these terms and try to embed them in your essay. Um, I'll be there to help you if you have trouble doing that. Um, some tips, you should take notes on the articles such videos you have chosen as sources, um, pull out specific quotes that you might want to use and throw into your paper, and do not avail yourself of subheadings. So um, don't be worried, you can use subheadings. It's your essay, it's your policy solutions, that, or it's your solutions that or proposals that you're offering to solve this problem. So maybe if you want, you can put historical context um, and then explain the historical context and then another subheading that says, um, solutions or proposals or whatever you want um, and maybe subheadings in in that as well. So use subheadings to help organize your thoughts if you want. Don't get sidetracked. Keep in mind the big picture. Um, although you're narrowing your social problem, you don't want to get caught up in the details. Like you don't want to get caught up in the details of a particular case of police brutality, um, no matter how interested you are in. And I'm sure it's interesting and it's important, but it's only a four to five page paper, right? So the bulk of it should be solutions that you're offering um, and um, general trends about whatever narrow social problem, however you made that narrow or that social problem of police violence and brutality more narrow. And then ask for help. I'll be there every step of the way to help you out. I would love to have a conversation with each and every one of you. Um, this is something I'm very passionate about. I'm passionate about um, solving all these social problems um, and I'm very well read in it, so I'm more than willing to help you find additional sources to support you in any way possible. Um, so what can, this can look like, uh, remember the two big sections, I guess the big takeaways from your essay should be like the history. Um, so you could talk about and go all the way back to like the civil rights movement and, and, and talk about the violent interactions with the police, particularly directed on um, African Americans um, and maybe civil rights legislation um, since then that may, may be run prop or one um, thing to that's one big section of your essay. The other big section of your essay is the solutions portion. What would these look like? There's all kinds of solutions in the articles that I've given you in the description of this YouTube video, but the solutions uh, can be something as um, like maybe implicit bias training. Maybe the police officers need to be um, educated and get more training about the kinds of biases that they have. Maybe that they don't think that they actually have, but maybe they actually have a lot of these biases and stereotypes about, um, you know, a particular group um, and how can they combat them. Um, implicit bias training is popular or is a popular solution that is floated around. Um, maybe something more dramatic needs to happen and maybe police officers need to see a lot of the funding that they receive rescinded. Maybe all those rifles and tanks and SWAT um, uh, or, or military vehicles that they're receiving needs to be taken away. Uh, maybe there needs to be some form of um, executive um, executive uh, role 
in, or like maybe the Justice Department needs to do a better job of investigating uh, police departments and determining if there's civil rights or civil liberties um, violations. You can get as creative as you want with these solutions. You can stick to solutions that are um, found uh, a lot and, and floated around in the articles, or you can come up with your own. I, I, I will definitely um, reward creativity. I hope this video has been helpful for you. Um, it certainly is a very important topic. Um, so yes, we...